Morning, my name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my um, pleasure to bring God's Word to you today. I encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 10 and stick your finger on verse 38. And while you're going there, uh, as believers, you know, we all know we're called to serve the Lord and one another in many ways. God's Word tells us that as each one of us has received a gift, we're to use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. So we've each been given a spiritual gift which we can, with which we can build up the church. And, and God intends us to use those gifts to do just that. And we're called to serve even above and beyond our gifting. I mean, the Bible tells all of us, calls all of us to share God's gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people, even if you're not a gifted evangelist. So, so we are supposed to serve. And, and I see many faithful believers here serving selfishly in a myriad of ways. Uh, it's fun. I get to be here and I see guys like Chuck who was working on installing an outlet in the entrance of the, uh, the nursery this week or, or Christy who was working on the, on the bulletin this week and, and many others. I could go on and on and list a great number of ways that you all serve the Lord and, and one another, teaching, discipling, encouraging, repairing, praying, helping with practical needs, counseling one another with God's word. The list goes on. And as your brother in Christ and as one of the pastors here, I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this, a body like this. You guys are awesome. I, I love the Christ-like spirit in which you serve one another. But I have found, and perhaps you have too, that sometimes when I step out to serve in some capacity, my initial motive might be really good, might be to serve Jesus by serving you or someone else. And, but gradually, as I continue in the task at hand, I could sometimes lose my focus on serving Christ as I'm serving somebody else. Anybody else ever have that happen? If it's not, we can just stop now because I guess this sermon is just for me. But my focus changes to serving me. It's remarkable. Even though I'm still doing the same things that I was doing when I was serving Jesus by serving somebody else. Something can happen inside of me where I, I lose track. And I, I think you can relate. And I know when it happens to me because there are some telltale signs. Signs in my heart and in my thinking and in my communication with others around me that reveal that my focus has moved from Christ to Dave. And, and my focus is centered on me, not the Lord. And again, I know I'm not the only one <laughs> because of Martha. We're going to see her in God's word today. She's central in today's passage. Can I say that the Bible is often raw in its honesty about the condition of all sorts of folks, including believers, right? And, and, uh, uh, and it's, it's raw in its honesty about how believers struggle. And today we're going to see Martha, a solid sister in the Lord, if there ever was one. Martha, fall prey to the same sinful struggle that I fall prey to, and, and I bet you do too sometimes. As she begins by serving Jesus with a pure motive, but then her focus turns inward and she begins to serve herself. And Jesus was going to point out why. And that answer that Jesus gives to Martha is the same answer he gives to me and the same answer he gives to you. Would you like to know it? Yeah. If we are to truly serve Jesus in our relationships at church, at work, at school, or wherever we find ourselves, there is one necessary thing we must remember and practice, what is it? It's this, true service overflows from a heart that draws near to hear Jesus. True service overflows from a heart that draws near to hear Jesus. And you notice the word true isn't up there, add it, because it, it explains it better. True service overflows from a heart that draws near to hear Jesus. Sorry, I'm always changing things at the last minute. I apologize, fellas. Do me a favor, please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. It says this, now, as they, that's Jesus and the disciples, went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. It's God's word for all of us today. Let's pray. Lord, I just simply ask you to help, uh, you'd help us to hear your word. Help me to say it right. Help me to get out of the way. Let us understand how um, absolutely crucial it is for each of us to draw near and hear you so that we might serve you and not serve ourselves. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. First thing I'm going to see in today's text are Martha and Mary's motivations at the beginning. You can see that in verse 38 and 39. Again, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So um, before I go on, just, just a little background. You know, it's possible that Luke has placed this passage here for thematic reasons and not chronological ones. Some uh, scholars believe that. Um, but I, have to, I happen to think that, no, this is actually in chronological order because the Greek word translated in English as went on their way uh, suggests that this is a continuation of the same journey we see Jesus beginning southward to Judea, uh, which began in chapter 9 and ultimately will end in Jesus' crucifixion in Jerusalem uh, in the future. So in verse 38... They enter a village, which is home to two sisters named Martha and Mary. And John 11 tells us that uh, uh, this home is actually, by the way, that, that they share with their brother Lazarus, who doesn't even get mentioned in the story here, is located in the village of Bethany, which is just on the other side of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. It's about a half mile walk away. You might even consider it a bedroom community of Jerusalem. Uh, verse 38 also tells us that Martha welcome Jesus, and the word wel translated welcome into her home is to, to welcome as a guest into one's home, right? So, she, so she's laying out the red carpet for Jesus. She's inviting Jesus to enjoy her hospitality, and, and by so doing, she's taking on the responsibility to care for Jesus' needs while he's there, for all of his meals and for his accommodations as long as he stays. And by the way, it's even possible that all the disciples are coming too, but Luke doesn't mention that because he's leaving out the details to get to the heart of what he wants us to see. Now, I can't help but notice that by Luke not giving us a lot of detail, by not naming the village, or mentioning that Lazarus also lives here, or, 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 or if the disciples are with him in the house or not, he doesn't share anything, whatever that Mary might have said. Only Martha gets to talk to Jesus in this one. Instead, Luke focuses on what both sisters set out to do and how Martha began to struggle and how Jesus pointed her to the one thing she needed above all. It's just, it's just real simple. Real. In fact, as a pastor, I, I, I can't improve it. I can only get in the way. So I got to be really careful. It's real simple and obvious. Martha was motivated, can we see here, to serve Jesus with great hospitality. You know, you like people like this, right? You know, uh, I like going to Karen's house because there's usually some yummy dessert, you know? I, we like people who are good at hospitality, right? You know? Um, so she, she was motivated to model the biblical admonition in Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So, so Martha was motivated to serve Jesus with great hospitality. And verse 39 tells us that Mary was motivated to sit at Jesus' feet and hear his teaching. Uh, to sit at the feet of someone pictures the act and position of a disciple. Just as the Apostle Paul in his younger days had been educated, quote, at the feet of Gamaliel, the famous rabbi, as a disciple of Gamaliel. Acts 22.3 says so. So by sitting at the feet of Jesus, she takes the position of a disciple of Christ. She's actively listening and taking in all that Jesus was teaching her. Why? Because she too is a disciple of Jesus. So now 
as we consider both sisters' motives, we see that both were motivated to honor the Lord, right? Martha by serving Jesus and Mary by being near and hearing Jesus. Good motives all around, right? You might think of it this way. Martha wanted to serve Jesus a meal of food fit for her Lord, and Mary wanted to eat the meal of God's word her Lord was serving. Both are good motives, right? So far, so good, right? Martha, motivated to serve Jesus. Mary, motivated to be near and hear Jesus. But as so often happens, <laughs> things can change in a heart of a believer, even while we're trying to serve the Lord. Now Luke is going to turn and focus solely on Martha because Martha's service begins to go sideways. Um, and she needs to learn, just like I need to learn and just like you need to learn, that true service overflows from a heart that draws near to hear Jesus. So we've looked at their motivations, and now we're going to see Martha's misdirected ministry. I'd originally wrote it, wrote it something like this, Martha's messed up ministry, but hopefully this is a little bit more pastoral. Martha's misdirected ministry. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him, Jesus, and she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But, starts verse 40, that word, I mean, that's, a, that's a contrast. We know that some, there, there's something, something is changing. Martha's good motivation to serve Jesus is morphing into something different. Martha is now distracted by much serving. In the midst of her great efforts to serve Jesus, and obviously, the, you know, she's, she's working at serving before we get to this point, she has become distracted. And the, the idea of, of that word is, is she's become internally overburdened, that, so internally overburdened to the point that her attention to Jesus has been pulled away, has been dragged away. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever had a burden on you as you're serving that kind of dragged your heart away from actually serving Jesus? And you're still doing the thing, but now it's like, mm, mm, it's hard. It's not joyful. And it's probably not fun for the people around you either, right? Her very efforts to serve Jesus were separating her from Jesus because she had lost touch with the Lord she was striving to serve. And no notice that her view of both Jesus and her sister is starting to warp. It's starting to change. Why? Because she's lost focus on Jesus, Martha's distraction from Jesus now leads to a distorted view of others, including her sister and including Christ. Check it out. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So in the midst of her inwardly overburdened and distracted state, Martha begins to feel personally offended by her sister and by Jesus. Martha went up to Jesus, she, she, by the way, not to be near to hear him, but to tell him something, right? She draws near to Jesus to criticize both Jesus and her sister. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve? Mono, M-O-N-O, -O, alone, right? In, in, in the midst of her inwardly overburdened state, don't you care, Jesus? Doesn't it concern you that Mary has left me to my own resources to accomplish what I'm trying to do for you? <laughs> now, come on, we don't usually say that, but we think it, right? Here I am trying to serve Jesus, and she's not helping. And you're not making her help. She might as well have said, Lord, doesn't it matter to you that my sister is sitting on her duff of discipleship and I'm left to set the table, mash the potatoes, carve the roast, pour the wine, slice the bread, and put the whipped cream on the pecan pie all by myself? Don't you care that my sister has left me, the serving one, to serve alone? And the implication in the Greek is that she expects Jesus to agree with her. Basically, she's trying to talk some sense into Jesus and suggest, by the way, I suggest when, when you're trying to talk sense to God the Son, um, you probably made an error of judgment somewhere along the line. But let's be honest, sometimes don't we think, you know, God, you should ought to be doing this. 
not what I don't see you doing right now. Furthermore, Martha's distraction from Jesus has led to her accusing Jesus of not caring and her own sister of not doing what Martha thinks she should be doing. Martha's distraction from Jesus has distorted her view of others, including her sister and Jesus, and now it leads her to become demanding of others, both her sister and Jesus. Martha was distracted with much serving. She went up to to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Notice the irony. Martha calls Jesus her Lord, her master, her courier, and then orders Jesus to do what she wants him to do. Literally, it's an order. Um, Second person, singular, fronted. It's an order. Jesus, you tell her. She's literally commanding Jesus. Who's the Lord here? Who's serving who? Who is upside down? Tell her then. The then points back to what she just said, the things that she expected Jesus to agree with. And the implication is that since she believes that Jesus must agree with her, that she should be, he should be concerned with the fact that Mary isn't doing what Martha has been doing. And because that is obviously wrong in Martha's eyes, tell her then to help me, right? Help me. Martha orders Jesus to compel Mary to join Martha in her service of Jesus, which isn't serving Jesus because she's distracted from Jesus and is now serving herself and demanding that others do the same. Martha is modeling the very weakness I'm prone to and you're prone to. Every believer, this can happen to us. We might start out with the best of motives, but when our service for Jesus ends up distracting us from Jesus because we don't have a sufficient blah, blah, because we don't have a sufficient vital connection ongoing to Jesus. Our view of others, including Jesus, can become distorted. And we can become resentful that others aren't doing it our way or contributing the same effort we are or seeing the same ministry priorities that we see. As we become irritable and demanding of others, and we attempt to get them to do what we want them to do, and ultimately we end up serving ourselves and not Christ. I have done this. And it's funny, on the outside, I'm probably doing the same things. On the inside, I'm serving me. It can happen to all of us, if it can happen to Mary. And we might even start thinking that Jesus himself has not supported us the way that we thought he should, because he should just appreciate the same priorities that we do. tough lesson, isn't it? Now, I think the reason the Holy Spirit inspired this particular passage was so that we can see ourselves in Martha. Really? So that we can see ourselves in Martha and take warning, because if we pay, if we pay attention to who the scripture tells us Martha is, we'll see that she is among the very best of us. Martha is no slouch. She's one of the most solid believers you're going to find in Scripture. John 17, verses 17 through 27, shows that her theology was amazingly solid. And she gives one of the most significant testimonies of Jesus' divinity and purpose ever recorded in Scripture when she answers Jesus' question about her belief in him with these words, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. John 17, 27. Martha knew that Jesus was the appointed Messiah foretold by the Old Testament prophets, that he was sent from heaven into the world by his father, God the Father, and that Jesus himself was the Son of God, God the Son. Martha's Christology is better than that of most theologians today. Martha's got solid theology. She's not a spiritual slouch, and Martha's ability to be hospitable isn't in question either. How do I know that? John 12, 3 shows her fully able to personally serve a feast in honor of Jesus with Jesus, all of his disciples, and even her own brother reclining at table at the same time. So it's not as if Martha has some organizational weakness. The opposite is true. She's fully able to organize the care and feeding of even a large group of guests. If anyone is gifted to be hospitable to others, it seems to me it's Martha. And we need to know that. Why? Because Martha is the best of us. 
theologically and in ability to serve. And she got distracted from Jesus. Her view became distorted and she became demanding because she started to serve herself. And if it can happen to Martha, it can happen to you. And I know it happens to me. No wonder 1 Peter 4, 9, and 10 reminds us that we must guard against grumbling. Gungus mooing in the Greek, I love that word. It sounds like what it is. It's gungus moo, gungus moo, gungus moo. When we are seeking to serve each other, it can, it, pretty soon it can devolve into a grumbling spirit because we're losing sight of the Lord whom we're really serving in the first place. We're, we're prone to go sideways and, and we can lose sight of the one whom we owe our service and we can fall into distraction, distortion and a de- demanding demeanor when we forget the reality that Jesus will make clear in the next two verses, the last two. True service overflows from a heart that draws near to hear Jesus. And we've seen Mar- Mary and Martha's motivations. We've seen Martha's misdirected ministry and, and now Jesus is gonna point out what matters most, third part. Look at verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And what I love about these two verses is how Jesus answers Martha. She's unjustly upset with both Jesus and her sister. She's chewed out Jesus for not caring. She's ordered Jesus to order her sister to obey her, but Jesus doesn't chew her out in return. I would. He's not angry. Instead, he's understanding. We, see, we serve a Lord who knows we're just dust, right? He knows we're, our weaknesses, and he understands our temptations. So he directs Can I say this? He redirects Martha to what she needs most with some very gentle words. Martha, Martha. It's a gentle rebuke. The repetition of her name is a clue that he's using tenderness to get her attention so that he can show her the reality that she's been blind to. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious. You are disproportionately concerned. You are inordinately worried. You're anxious and troubled about many things. You're distressed, you're upset, you're distracted about a whole bunch of stuff. Which points back to the much serving that distracted her back in verse 40. In Martha's attempts to serve Jesus, she got out of balance. She overprioritized many things that weren't as important as she thought they were. You ever done that? You know, especially in the places where we like to serve, you know, it looks like to me Marcia, Martha, Martha is, is, uh, uh, is really good at hospitality, right? So she's emphasizing she's good at. You ever done that? And all of a sudden that becomes like the most important gift in the world, you know? And you need to recognize it. Just like, hey, preaching is the most important gift in the world. You best recognize that, right? And if you don't agree with me, I'm going I'm to get mad at God for not correcting you, right? Yeah. Sorry. I should stay on script. I say stupid things when I don't. You see, in her attempts to serve Jesus, she gets out of balance because she over-prioritized things that were were good, but they weren't as important as she thought they were. And and this left her overburdened, troubled, distressed, and distracted from Jesus. But Jesus doesn't leave her there. Instead, he redirects her to the one choice that is foundational to every Christian's life. The one choice that is foundational to every Christian's life, without which our service to Christ will not serve Christ at all, but instead it will end up serving self. The Lord answered her, verse 41 again, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing, just one, is necessary. Just one thing is crucial. One thing is key. One thing above all must have the highest priority. And then Jesus points to Mary's choice as the answer. Martha, Mary has chosen the good portion. 
In context, the good portion is the one necessary thing. The one necessary thing that Mary has chosen and Martha needs. Mary chose to prioritize being near and hearing Jesus. And Martha, like Mary, needs to choose to be near and hear from Jesus too. Because disciples of Jesus, all true believers, don't live lives of true service in our own strength and wisdom, but only in constant communication, communion with our Lord. Because apart from choosing to draw near and hear Jesus, other priorities, including very good and very Christian ones, will take the place of Jesus. And rather than serve Jesus, we're going to end up serving self in Jesus' name. Martha, Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen the good portion. The Greek word translated chosen here implies that the person must make the choice for themselves. Nobody else can make it for you. You gotta make it for yourself. And the choice is made, the implication is because the choosing is because you prefer what you're choosing, Jesus, over something else. We will choose to be near and hear Jesus when we see communion with him as the good portion, as the most important thing, as the most necessary thing. And I don't mean communion here, although that's communion too, but I mean being near and hearing him on a daily basis through his word and in prayer. Disciples of Jesus, true believers, don't live lives of true service in our own strength. We must choose. We must choose to be near and hear the Lord. And we're going to only choose to be near and hear him when we, see, when we see him as the necessary portion, as the good portion. Mary has chosen the good portion. She's chosen the good share, the good part. Mary has chosen that which is best, that which is essential. Mary has made a choice based on her estimation of what is the highest priority in life, the highest value. And she has chosen why? Because she's a disciple of Christ. And she's chosen to sit at his feet and listen closely to his words because to her, Jesus is what she needs above all. Jesus is what you need above all. Believer, Jesus is what you need above all. To focus on being near and hearing her Savior was Mary's choice. Why? Because that is the greatest priority. And Jesus reinforces just how important it is to him that she made that choice. What does he say? Mary has chosen the good portion, hear this, which will not be taken away from her. This is God the Son saying, ain't nobody going to take it away. Martha had wanted Jesus to command Mary to do what Martha wanted her to do, to leave Jesus' presence and do what Martha said. But Jesus is clear that Mary is doing what is best. And Jesus confirms that, she will, that, that he will not allow Martha to deprive her of that privilege, of the opportunity to commune with Jesus either now or in the future. Can I say this, believer? The Lord won't let anything stand in the way of your choice to commune with him. Why? Because he knows it's the most necessary thing for you. Nothing will stand in the way of your fellowship with Christ except your choice not to prioritize it most highly. And Martha and you and I need to have Mary's chosen priority at heart because if we allow ourselves to be distracted away from a vital connection to Jesus, from hearing his word, from regular communion with him, we too will end up with a distorted view of our Lord and other believers. And we too may become demanding that others join us in our distracted state, all the while thinking we're serving the Lord when we're not. And as a perfect example of how not to do it, um, I'll admit to you one day last week while we were on vacation, I did not spend any time in God's word. And I became self-centered. 
grouchy with a distorted view, demanding. Just ask my wife. If it can happen to Mary, it can happen to all of us. I don't think we realize how badly we need the Lord daily. Close proximity to Jesus, spiritually speaking, is necessary for effective service of Jesus. And we draw near to him through the word and through prayer. And there we are equipped to serve in a way that prioritizes our relationship to Jesus above all in the midst of our serving. And this closeness to Christ and his word keeps our service to him from drifting into distraction, distortion, and a demanding heart towards others. Jesus said, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to my disciples. Prove to be my disciples. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 1 John 15, 5, 15, 7, and 8. 1 John 12, 26. Notice that those who abide in Christ, who choose the necessary thing, who are near to and hear the words of Christ glorify God by producing the fruit of genuine disciples. Discipleship begins with and depends upon a continual relationship with Christ. What is the one necessary choice that we must make as believers? That I've got to make, you've got to make. And it's not a choice you make once, it's a choice you make every day. What's the choice that we must continue to make from day to day? It's this, to be near and hear Jesus. Everything else flows from that. Everything else flows from that. And the reality of our nearness and our willingness to hear the word is shown in the focus of our acts of service. Other people might not see it, but God does. Why? Because our service is truly centered upon Jesus and not on ourselves. And we're not distracted from him, but we're connected to him. And we don't have a distorted view of others or our Lord because we're, we're not blinded by our flesh taking over. And, and we are not demanding of others because instead we take joy in the different ways believers may serve Christ, which are different from the way we may do so. True service overflows from a heart that draws near to hear Jesus. And apart from a consistent and vital relationship with Jesus through his word, our service will become empty, joyless, and ultimately self-centered. For those of you who've been believers for a long time, can I get an amen? <laughs> because that's true in my life. That's so true. In my, apart from a consistent and vital relationship with Jesus through his word, life becomes empty. Life becomes joyless. And life becomes self-centered. So in, in conclusion, let me connect our need for regular communion with Christ for being near and hearing him to the gospel. <clears throat> Once we all, like the rest of humanity, were under the wrath of God for our sins, we know that. Our rebellion, our defiance of our creator earned us the sentence of death in hell. But God, in mercy, sent Jesus, his divine son, to save repentant sinners like us. He took on humanity and lived as the only truly righteous man to ever walk the earth. And then, as truly righteous, Jesus offered himself as a substitute, sacrifice, one righteous man for a whole parcel of unrighteous sinners. He took our death sentence upon himself. Jesus' death in our place on the cross satisfied divine justice for all who would repent. And Jesus' resurrection from the death purchased new life for all who would repent. And, and we received that new life the moment we, by God's grace, trusted in Jesus, the Son, turning away from our own sinful life and turning to Jesus, get this, who is our life. We turn to him for life because he is life. He's the author of life. For every believer, as Paul said in Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ. 
To know Jesus is to know life. Jesus is the source. And we have that life eternally because whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son does not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. John 3, 36. See, this is ultimate reality. (laughs) To truly know Christ is to have life. Is to be connected to life because he is the source of life. And I pray that if you have not turned from your sins to trust in Christ, you'll do so today. You can do that. You got to do business with him though, not with me. You're not promised tomorrow. Turn to Christ today. But for those of us who have already trusted in Christ, we love him because he first loved us and he saved us and his love for us compels us to serve him. He is our sovereign and very good Lord and we make it our aim to please him with our lives, 2 Corinthians 5.10. But we know that we're still in process, right? We're still being sanctified. We're still fighting against our flesh and the sin within our members and we're still able to be distracted away from Jesus even by good things and even by ministry. So we gotta be on guard to monitor the affections of our own heart. We gotta gotta be on guard. Is, Is Christ still central in my affections today or not? And when we find ourselves doing Christian service with a heart that's distracted and disconnected from Jesus, and although the things we're doing may look like ministry to others, we're really doing what we're doing for ourselves. That's a sign I almost want to say, you may, like, you may be like Martha if, but I, I just say, that's not fair. It's throwing Martha under the bus because this all happens to us, right? Uh, you might be distracted if you find yourself doing Christian service with a heart that's disconnected from Christ. It might look like ministry, but you're doing it for yourself. That, that's a sign that you're distracted. And it's a sign that you need to reprioritize and make one necessary choice today and tomorrow and the next day and carve out time in your schedule to be near and hear Jesus. Uh, You might be distracted if your perspective on others is distorted. And maybe you're becoming critical of other people, especially other believers, because they're not serving in the way you want them to or because they don't value your service as much as you do and they don't quickly join you in the task that you've chosen. You might be distracted. Oh, you might be distracted if you begin to think that God isn't doing what you think he should be doing. And God should intervene in the lives of others to bring them around to your point of view. That's a sign that you need to choose the one thing that's necessary and reorient your thinking and feed your soul with the good portion by drawing near to Jesus through his words. By the way, when I say you, I also mean me. Please know that. I'm in the same boat. And you know, we might be distracted when we find ourselves demanding, becoming demanding and critical of other believers. Why? Because they don't share our priorities in ministry. They don't see why it's so very important that they join what we're fixing to do. They don't share our priorities and and that's a sign, if I'm upset about that, that I need to humble myself and reconnect to the vine to draw near to Christ and be changed by his word and begin again to serve Christ in his power with his pleasure in mind. If if rock solid Martha can become distracted, distorted and demanding, all of us can have that. So in today's passage, Jesus is directing all of us to choose one necessary thing. Regular communion with him through his word. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But by remaining near to Jesus to hear him, we become useful servants. We really do. Serving others, not for ourselves, but for the pleasure of Christ. True service for Jesus overflows from hearts that draw near to hear Jesus. Here's the question, believer. Will you draw near to him today? I've hoped hoped you draw near to him during the service. But how about tomorrow? How about the next day? How about your day off? That's the hardest day for me. How about your vacation? How about now that your schedule is filling up with new school? Are you going to find time for the one necessary thing? Make the one necessary choice and make it again and again. And you and I will take joy in truly serving the one who saved us. 
Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your clear word. You haven't designed us clearly to function apart from you, but instead we thrive in in intimate connection with you through your word. Lord Jesus, please help each of us to prioritize our time with you, to make time in our schedules, to, to open up your word and let you feed us in our souls and let you direct our paths. Lord, we need you so much, way more than we know, way more than we admit. Help us to know in greater and greater measure the comfort of your presence, the sweetness of your word, and the joy of serving you with the right heart. I pray that in your name, Lord. Amen.